Hi YouTube, welcome back to another video. I'm really really sorry it's been quite a while since the last one. That's sort of how sort of my channel goes really. I have these large periods of sort of um well these large gaps between videos and creating sort of stuff because a lot of stuff goes on personal life so thing especially with the coronavirus as well. It's made a thing a lot of things difficult. Um so I'm just having to and also I haven't really wanted to make a few videos for a while because I've been waiting on a few things to come through. And there's some things I had to send back, and as I said with the corona virus, it makes it a lot more difficult um, to have exchanges with mail, etc. So lately it's been a bit difficult. But apart from that, <clears throat> here's another video. Um, main topic of today's video is going to be about what's next for me here, and also then um, near the end we'll I'll focus on some little things which I've picked up um, in the meantime as well, as well as this obviously. And some things have for a while, but I haven't really shown on the channel. Um, so yeah, so we'll crack on. <clears throat> so what is next to me is what is colloquially known in sort of the reenactor community as the 1940 battle dress, which is complete nonsense. Um, it's just a reenactorism, like a lot of other things, just like... It's become sort of like the usual term used within sort of... and. Uh, same websites say like Soldier of Fortune, for example, this style of bat, um, style of battle dress is known as the 1940 pattern for no reason really whatsoever. Um, it, it's a bit of sort of like like 1937, even though the one they label as 1937 is the second style of battle dress, which makes no sense. Um, but that's so this is the econo the um, uh, economy version, I should say. Much more simple made. There's no um, uh, the buttons aren't covered, so there's less material used. Most of the buttons on this now are all of a plastic design, um, rather than brass, which the earlier ones were. Um, and sort of the slight bit of things in the cut and everything. Apart from that, though, still a very very good battle dress. Still a very very good, um, bit of clothing. Very very sturdy. Very very rugged. Designed to last a long time, as it has and. This specific example is a 1944 dated one, um, British made. I'll show a picture of the label at the end of the video, um, and then you can get an idea sort of thing. I can't remember the name of the company, but as, as I said, we'll have a look at the end. <coughs> Excuse me. So let me just have a quick sip, quickly. Ah, that's nice. A bit of tea. Um, so as I said, exposed buttons, etc. That's really sort of the main defining thing of this battle, of this battle dress. And also some different additions, so from the earlier ones, the buckle that is used to taper the waist belt um, to, to uh, secure the waist belt is uh, sort of a tooth design. It does differ from um, some variations, maybe manufacturer differences, but generally it's sort of more of sort of a later thing to see the tooth design, which allows it not to be sort of uh, it doesn't it stops it from um, opening too easily <coughs> when under general sort of stress when you're wearing it. Um, uh, as I said, a very very nice little find really. Um, Original battle dresses these days are getting a nice high price, um, so they're very very sought after. So getting one at the price I did, which was um, about half the price is what you normally see, especially British made ones at, um, is very very good. <coughs> so we'll crack on. So uh, I have this. I have been um, adding. Uh, some insignia to it. I was holding off the video until the rest of the insignia arrived, but it's been taking a very long time. As I said, with the with um, COVID nineteen, it's made mail very very delayed. So there are some parts of the insignia which aren't on there yet, which will be later. Um, as you can see, sort of unlike because it, it sort of depended from manufacturer to manufacturer the way certain cuts were and everything. Um, for instance, you see some. Of the same style of battle dress, which are more open collar. This one tends to sort of meet in the middle more, which I quite like actually. It's a nice, it's, it's nice sort of how that cut was done, etc., and things like that. But things did vary from manufacturer and country to country, for example. Um, large breasted pockets, um, not not pleated like the earlier um, styles, um, like the earlier manif earlier marked ones, basically. Some more sort of the less, well, the less, the non-economic ones, I should say. Um, obviously, you'll keep sort of say um, your documents in these sort of breast pockets, your pay book, etc., and other items of that sort of nature, or depending on what you're doing with it at the time. And <clears throat> this is more sort of set up for home, ser sort of home service at the moment. 
um, uh, pre the invasion of Normandy, so just prior, um, so probably just like um, around the backs or uh, um, not necessarily off camp because most troops were confined to camp at this point leading up to the invasion. Um, and if you were to venture outside the camp, you would be at the prey of the MPs who, as most squaddies will know, are um, so the devil incarnate in some aspects, but that's necessary. Um, so I have this battle at the moment as a uh, company sergeant major or CSM from the uh, Hampshire Regiment at the time. Uh, as, I, as I said, um, I've had the Hampshire Regiment um, items, Royal Hampshire Regiment later known, on this channel quite a few times. Family connections, that's mainly, and I know more about that sort of subject than most other regiments, for example. So that's sort of where I focus on, that's where my main focus lies. Mainly the British Army and colloquially around Hampshire, Royal, later Royal Hampshire Regiment, things along that lines. So <clears throat> as of as sort of leading up to the invasion itself, um, in terms of insignia, it would be the red um, backed, uh, so white lettering on red backed shoulder titles of just Hampshire. Earlier styles um, are like the one on the one behind me there, which was sort of the unofficial. Well, it, it was sort of the, it was the official um, regimental um, shoulder title, I should say, um, as it was sort of gold lettering on black backing of the Hampshire Regiment, um, abbreviated regiment, um, which was <coughs> changed prior to the invasion for all um, assault troops, apart from a few um, regiments which did have altering. We should have different many from the second and third waves, but mainly the first wave assault troops had, <coughs> um, the first day assault troops had all the same style of uh, shoulder title. Obviously, what is missing off this is the divisional patch, which would be the ties and tees, <coughs> um, which is the 50th Northumbrian Division. Um, so, um, actually, I think I've got a small example I can show you. Um, this is a sort of bad sort of copy um, of one which I won't be using so the Tines and Tees division you can just see that um, so the two T's of Tines and Tees two rivers and then obviously if you turn on the side the H for the Humper as well so for the Northumbrian division um, 231 Brigade which um, the ham um, first battalion in the Hampshire Regiment was attached to along with the Devons and Dorsets which were made up 231 Malta Brigade who obviously had been in Malta during the siege <clears throat> were attached to the division in order to make the division on that landed on Gold Beach um, the most experienced division um, in the whole of the whole of the British Army. Well, going ashore that day and sort of just post that as well until other divisions arrive, like say like the Seventh Armoured Division, the Desert Rats, and then the Fifty First Highlands as well, um, who'd come in later, who were very experienced troops who had taken part in several amphibious landings in Sicily and in Italy itself and a lot of guys especially from 231 Brigade who've taken part in so many assault landings and have seen so much action throughout the war so far weren't particularly pleased of um, being the uh, spearhead of the assault um, <clears throat> they they thought they'd done their part and they thought they it was someone else's turn and I don't blame them I don't blame them if you've taken part in two assault landings and seen enough of your friends get killed it kind of kind of puts a thing on you, but <laughs> going back from uh, that tangent, but <clears throat> I will go in sort of similar sort of things like that. Probably in a later video, I'll go in sort of the history of the regiment and then obviously two through one brigade as it stands as well. But coming back to this itself, Ham um, as I said, Hampshire shoulder titles on the cuff. We have um, company sergeant major or CSM for short, um, uh, cuff insignia um, for all um, warrant officers. Um, and Sigma was one on the cuff, so W1, W2, for example. <coughs> These are original um, uh, Sigma, uh, my um, great grandfather's, who um, was a company sergeant, and then later regimental sergeant major with the um, uh, Royal Engineers. <coughs> so that's them, obviously, one on each side, and they've gone on, and it, it really, really sort of creates a nice. Um, whole package really for the uh, for it. Um, moving up quickly, we'll talk about quickly about headdress. So this particular headdress is sort of the sort of home service sort of cap, um, forage cap, 
obviously the you have overseas service or um the um sort of uh green sort of garbadine style um <coughs> of service cap um this one is sort of more sort of it's more regimental orientated um more so safe some months you see it a lot in photographs etc uh, for like personal photographs of of um guys in uniform specifically and obviously it's very much an officer thing as well so more sort of arranged that i think it wasn't really you didn't see him wearing the field it was only really say um for um on camp or going out really sort of thing that's when you sort of see this little cap and some regiments didn't really adopt some regiments sort of got rid of them as far as i'm aware during the period of the war but some regiments get hold of them there are some pictures of them within and without so i can't it's it's a bit of sort of a mixed history around these sort of items you they're very difficult to find nowadays and they're getting a bit more scarce because i know sort of, especially with, with guys who are in the regiment they tended to keep theirs um say compared to the standard um uh green forage caps um these were more sort of sort these were more sort of kept up because they were regimental because say the colors etc were um that sort of orientated this one specifically is more of an officer style um but generally for this sort of set i've just put the normal infantry cap badge because with the with the regiment itself they did differ between um officers and and men um between the different cap badges which i will go into in a little bit in a minute <coughs> um so with this one specifically you have the regimental badge regimental buttons on the front which have the uh obviously the cap badge um on it cap badge itself standard of the, of the period until until 1946 when it was made royal um cap badges do slightly differ between the wars and um, the wreath in this one is obviously separated at the top it differs slightly from the so from the from early war and then obviously first world war as well where the wreath is is complete it's just slightly different i, I think it might be a manufacturing thing or it is slight change in what is sort of shown. <coughs> Excuse me. But in, in terms of the forage cap itself, it's um, uh, yellow on the sort of the main top part, which is similar to a lot of other regiments, but um, um, I say for the sort of the line regiment, it's sort of a yellow thing um, and denoting sort of the um, uh, officer sort of style. Normally this um, band, this... Uh, Piping here would normally be just yellow, as the same as uh, it is on the top. This one is sort of more of a gold or braid piping. Um, very, very nice piece, and um, I was quite lucky to get a hold of it, really. Um, it was sort of tricky uh, in that sort of um, effect. Um, and obviously, I said about the cat badge on the side. Um, I'll try and find the manufacturer, um, see what, what manufacturer made it, because it's difficult. This one doesn't have any uh, specific things on it. But I'll have a look around and see what else I can find. Um, <clears throat> it's not really much really to talk about. It's a standard um, late war battle dress. Um, I'll quickly turn it around the back actually. Let's show you sort of the, the, the weave is it's a it's a lovely lovely piece. Um, also just got the thirty seven pattern belt on there. I'm sort of so sort of more of a sort of um, uh, sort of smart dress sort of outside barracks really. Um, but yeah, it's a lovely, lovely piece, and as I said, I'll get the rest of the, the signal on there. So, divisional, and then also arms of service um, uh, insignia as well. So, these, which were arms of service, so it's obviously the red is standard infantry, but also it, it denotes, um, um, if you, I think I think one was just, so one on each, one on each arm was denoting the senior, um brigade i believe and then three uh, it di it differs i have to find, i'll have to look into it some more but as far as i'm aware it denotes the seniority of the brigade i think you're you're within as far as i'm aware so if if anyone does know exactly um please let me know but as far as i'm aware that is the case um let's turn this back around here so yeah it's a lovely, lovely piece any questions on this specific um specific item please let me know i'd love to hear um anything um put it in the comments below or i have my personal facebook if you just want to message me on there <coughs> excuse me or i have my um the a page separate so um 
British Army essentially at war um, page I do have. If you want to um, contact me through there as well, please um, feel free to do so. Um, about this specific thing or anything other really. So um, now going from this, we'll crack on and we'll have a look at some other items. Okay, next item. So this obviously is another battle dress. Um, this specific one is actually a early of style, obviously no lined collar, for example. Uh, this early style of battle dress, uh, but this one's Australian made. This one specifically is made in 1941 in Sydney. So <clears throat> very sort of a much later production version of this, but obviously Australia um, wasn't... Um, blockaded in the way obviously the United Kingdom was um, um, obviously they were stripped from the Japanese obviously um, during obviously after 1941 excuse me um, but well after late 1941 <coughs> but um, but obviously their production was still um, in the way of battle dress which um, obviously was worn obviously but not Obviously, in country it was in um, Australia. It was one, but not not as not one as much outside of Australia. And um, for example, um, apart from say when in when in Britain, um, in parades, for example, or just generally in Britain anyway, um, because obviously most Australian soldiers didn't see service in um, Northwest Europe, for example. Obviously, they saw service in Italy, but obviously they'd be using KDs and things like that, for example, and obviously. In uh, Southeast Asia, in Burma, etc., and obviously in conjunction with the Americans. <coughs> but um, obviously, I said, so this is Australian made battle dress um, of the earlier style, so pleated pockets, exp um, covered buttons. These buttons, as well, actually, are of. Um, you can tell it's very Australian by the colour. It's very, very similar to um, the colour of um, the service tunic worn early in the war. Um, by most Australian units, and obviously that are used by the Australians during the First War as well. And um, the colour is very, very similar. And also the uh, buttons itself are very much sort of a, a typical colour for um, just I don't know. It, it just seems a very Australian esque um, construction. Well, just colour and of different items, etc. But it's a lovely, lovely piece. Um, certainly doesn't fit me round the. Uh, Around the chest and uh, stomach, um, I have put a bit of weight in in past in past years. So, but this one doesn't fit me sadly. But I hope to be losing a bit of weight, and it hopefully it will. But apart from that, it's it's a lovely, lovely piece. Collar size is actually very, very nice. It's actually very, it's a nice and um, wide collar actually. Um, and what you mean? And compared to say the the battle dress surge, for example, uh, this is a lot thinner. It's it's more of a um. How do I describe it? Sort of in similar sort of like um, feel of the cloth compared to say um, uh, service dress like number twos um, in the post-war years in the sixties etc. Similar sort of that sort of thing. Um, it's much more sort of finer, uh, almost like it's specifically made for say parade use really only because um, there are the times you only really see it. Um, for example, is either well you 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 read you. You'll be hard pressed to find these being used in combat by the Australians. Um, very, very hard to find, because obviously the Australians are mostly fighting in hot climates in North Africa, in Italy, Sicily, and and then the Far East, as I said. Um, but apart from that, it's a very, very lovely um, piece. Um, it, similar to that of the early style. Obviously, I'd say about the piece of pockets, but also status sort of a loop style of buckle. Compare that to the uh, later style, which has a sort of um, a clasp with teeth. To stop it from sliding back and forth too easily. Um, I'll quickly open it up and then we'll take a look inside actually. So, just see that on the camera. Let's get them towards the camera. There you go. So, made in Sydney. So, name is VC uh, Tweedy as far as I can make out. Regiment is um, fourth COL. I'm not sure. Or regiment number. Sorry, my mistake. Um, the uh, C uh, C M E F Clothing Company uh, Limited, uh, Sydney, 1941. Oh, sorry, taking it away. <laughs> 
Sydney 1941 size uh, 11. A very, very nice piece nonetheless. Um, and on the shoulder button as well, it's a... Uh, um, what you would sort of see on, say, the late style of British battle dress. Um, them sort of buttons, really. But it's a very, very nice piece. And again, price-wise, wasn't too bad, considering what it is as well. Um, but yeah, a nice addition to the collection. And um, I've, been hoping, I've been trying to build up an Australian um, wartime uh, configuration for a while now. But um, this is a nice addition to the uh, collection. So we'll move, now we'll move on to the next part. <clears throat> and we're back with another item. Um, you've probably seen this in other videos before, etc. Um, you've seen the larger version of this in one of my videos. Um, and the larger version obviously is a battle jerk, and this is the skeletonized version, or skeleton vest, or many, many different names of reenactorisms and what it's really supposed to be called. But it's basically this. It's basically just a skeleton. It's basically like an assault. It's basically an assault vest. Is the sort of um, the more modern term, um, and basically it's just uh, a, a stripped down version of the battle jerk in, in all intents and purposes. All that you really have, and it sort of slightly differs from version to version and maker and early earlier types to later types. This specific one, I believe, is sort of a more later type. I believe, basically, all only really sort of add on sort of coupons or the um, <clears throat> are the uh, bayonet frog attachments for the uh, number four, which is here. I believe it can obviously it can also fit the um, uh, the 1907 sword bayonet, but um, I haven't really tried it out. But I guess it would obviously easily fit there with some slight overhang. But apart from that, it should do fine. Um, the main use of it is the carry brand magazines. This vest in, in general, obviously the two angled um, pouches. This specific one is a reproduction. Um, by um, Shoot and Scoot, uh, who do a lot of actual original kit actually, um, alongside their quite good reproductions. It's not the best in the market, I give it that, but for the price you pay, I would say it's actually a very, very, um, very, very good thing. There are a lot of other reproductions out there which I will be looking into, which are a bit more on the sort of a stupid side of um, price, but um, another another thing doesn't hurt really. My wallet doesn't think that though, uh, but apart from that, that's the point. So as I said, two angle pouches for Bren magazines, and um, they can fit about two mag, two to three magazines each, I think, from the depth, maybe just two, or any other items you wish to sort of carry and say, carry two magazines in one, and then sort of similar to sort of what and some of the um, infantry would to carry, um, say, extra bandolier or grenades in one, and then Bren magazines in the other. <coughs> um, very very comfortable to wear actually. Um, Obviously, it means a lot of life to load. Um, but yeah, um, obviously, seen a lot with the uh, say commandos, etc., and other such units. Um, but yeah, no, a very, very nice item. I'll quickly just turn it over. You can see the back. Obviously, it's sort of like a, almost like a yoke style of system, really, where it sort of comes over the shoulders and joins with sort of a central pillar in the back, and obviously, just a simple waist belt at the bottom. With the uh, bayonet uh, slot on the uh, side, but yeah, so that's that item. Um, I'll just uh, get this out of the way, and I'll show you the uh, last one, which was sort of a thing back to earlier. And here's the next part. So just a quick comparison between uh, the two cap badges of the regiment during the war, uh, well, and post-war really, for well, for most of its um, period during the uh, 20th century, really. Uh, so showing the um, officers one is here below on the green beret. Um, just ignore the beret itself. Um, it's just what the uh, ba um, cap badge is on at the moment. Um, obviously the um, officers cap badge is s kind of similar to that of the courtroom guards in a way, with the sort of a star with the uh, rounded centre. And then also, I think the courtroom guards didn't have a crown at one point, but I, I can't remember. I have to have a look at it again. Can't remember off the top of my head, but yeah, I'm sure it's an, uh, officers one. So, King's Crown, which is, I think was St. Edward's Crown, later going on to the um, Imperial Crown um, in the 50s, obviously with the coronation of the uh, of Queen Elizabeth II. Even though they weren't known as royal at this point, the officer's cap badge still um, well, or, um, had the crown anyway. I think it's sort of, you know, it's sort of an officer thing. It's, it's, it's a weird... I don't know the exact reason why, but <clears throat> this was it during the war, and I believe during the First War as well. 
as far as, yes, yes, I believe so, yeah. So I'm, I'm trying to remember this off the top of my head. Um, I have written it down, but it's over there at the moment, so yeah. But yeah, so this is the office cat, um, cat badge. I'll quickly just quick bring the other one up to compare. So there's the two. Um, obviously, the Hampshire is more sort of in tune to sort of the regimental history in a way, with the tiger, etc. But Officer's one is star with the Hampshire rose in the centre. And obviously, on the standard um, other ranks one, it's the rose at the bottom below the uh, tiger. And obviously the the laurel wreath around, but that's a nice little comparison between the two. Um, obviously, both will change, and um, post war, um, this one would change in 1946, um, and then obviously slight change again in 1953. This one would only change in 1953. That's them two um, little parts. So thank you very much. Um, we're just going to the next part now. And another addition to the collection is this lovely thing. Um, obviously, for most of you, you can tell what it is. This is a rifle number no. four, Mark One. Um, <clears throat> this one is specifically made at Savage, uh, made by Savage in the United States. So we'll take a look at those markings in a second. Um, a very nice piece, and I've been after a number no. four for a while. Sorry, a rifle number no. four. Um, so yeah, obviously now I've sort of um, my. Uh, SMLE has now a, uh, or rifle number one, Mark III, has a uh, has a younger sister now. So, um, so yeah, I'll just quickly um, bring it up close to the camera, and we'll have a look at sort of the finer details. <coughs> so, unlike British production uh, models, there is no markings. If you could sort of make that out, probably not from the camera. There are no markings on the uh, on the collar. Um, like on British um, made examples um, the markings are on top of the receiver so you see US property and then should be there you go Savage number four just marked there and obviously the uh, the, no the um, number itself um, according to the rifle of manufacture this is um, of early style design with some later additions, so has the early style dial sight of the uh, Mark ones. I believe this is a Mark One star, but with the early style sight, because I can. I think it's a star because of the way the uh, um, way you take off, take out the bolt, or remove the bolt is of the uh, of the uh, star design with the notch rather than the. Uh, Attach plunger to the side there, but yeah, it's a lovely, lovely piece, and um, it will be uh, um, featuring a lot more on the channel later on. Um, so hope you enjoyed. Um, this was sort of a main addition, sort of for this new year, um, with hat green with sort of the uh, Malaya um, aspect. I was going to focus on more this year, but obviously with um, COVID nineteen, it's a bit of a hassle, really, right? Really. So. Um, Yep, that's the video for today. Thanks for watching. Uh, like, comment, subscribe, and also any attachment down here, comment in the uh, description. Please uh, go and check those out. All right, thanks. Bye.